Most of you know me, but my name is John Saltes. I'm an instructor here at uh, County College of Morris. And today, the Legacy Project presents The Lost Child of Cambodia. And we are excited to hear Sion's story and learn about the Cambodian genocide. The Legacy Project began in 2013 with an event remembering the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Movement. We continued with a lecture on the influential Beat Generation. And this entire academic year, we've been focused on the theme of genocide. In the fall semester, we heard from Eugenie Mukishimana, a survivor of the Rwanda genocide, and Maud Dami, a survivor of the Holocaust. Today, we look at Cambodia in the 1970s, a place and time period dominated by the Khmer Rouge, headed by Pol Pot. According to Yale University's Cambodia Genocide Program, the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot combined extremist ideology with ethnic animosity and a diabolical disregard for human life to produce repression, misery, and murder on a massive scale. The end result was quite frightening. Estimates as low as 1.7 million and as high as over 2 million Cambodians lost their lives from 1975 to 1979. And I just found out from Sion and, and his sister-in-law today that this will be the 40th anniversary um, of, of sort of the beginning of the genocide in Cambodia in 1975. That's about 20%, maybe 25% of Cambodia's entire population. Today's program looks at one of the lives affected by the genocide, that of Sion, who is the subject of a new documentary called Lost Child, Sion's Journey. This film, which is scheduled to appear on PBS this spring, um, is going to be, we're going to have a film screening today of about 15 minutes, followed by a moderated Q&A, and then hopefully at the end, we're hoping that you have some questions for Sion as well. I think that this particular story might feel very far away for many of us because we don't have similar experiences, but that's exactly what the Legacy Project is about, that this is sort of our world, and this is not someone's story so far away. It's all of our stories that we need to learn and hopefully, hopefully build a better future um, um, tomorrow if we can. We're going to show this 15-minute selection right now from Lost Child, and thank you very much for coming today. I hope you learn a lot from today's program. Well, thank you for coming and thank you for having me. I think it's going to be excited and uh, uh, I'm sure you all have been uh, uh, waiting and also in, uh, excited to ask me questions and to learn a little bit more and uh, a little bit in that in, in terms of the, my uh, stories, I guess. Yeah, yes. and I, I so, guess I'll, I'll get us started. Um, before today's program, I'd asked him if there was anything I shouldn't ask that he wouldn't like to cover, and he said it, he's pretty open to, to talking about the experiences. I guess to, to begin, after seeing um, that 15 minutes of the film, do you have any memories of before you were abducted at the age of six, sort of, of family life with your parents? Uh, yes, I sort of very, very vivid of memory about uh, my childhood. I think we have about... Um, the memory that I have is that my, my mother always stay home and uh, my father um, always been out somewhere doing something. Um, although um, we are sort of a farm, I think we own a lot of farm, but I'm not sure if my father um, ever doing farm. And I believe that in my memory, I think we have um, uh, eight siblings. But I, I don't know for sure. Um, after me, sort of very vivid until I think later on I found out I did have um, three uh, younger siblings that, um, that I really did not uh, remember or actually known of, of their names until recently. Okay. Did, do you have memories of the day or the days when you were sort of taken at the age of six? Do you have any sort of um, idea of how that happened? Yeah. Um, well, I think in the movie, a little bit um, of uh, my parents told me not to go far away from home is because they're afraid of 
um, being kidnapped. And I think the term that they use it was um, in Khmer is called Brumat Prambang, but I think it's similar to the boogeyman. If you, you, know, if you go out far away somewhere, the boogeyman is going to get you or whatnot. Um, but um, I think on that day, particular day, my friend and I sort of doing our routines activity, which is going out there um, in the rice paddies and looking for um, something to do to amuse ourselves. So all of you over here back then probably, you know, uh, wake up playing uh, Barbie dolls and G.I. Joe figures and whatnot. Um, for us, we, I would go in there and looking for crickets, frogs, and toads so that we can have them, you know, watch some cricket fights if it's a way of amusing ourselves. So, and then just mentioning the film a little bit, I just said it because then I saw the full uh, uh, truckloads of children. And they are singing, they look very, very fun. And then I thought, hey, it probably wouldn't hurt to just jump on a truck because I don't want to miss all the fun. And that's sort of the last time I ever seen my hometown or my parents and siblings. You never saw your parents after that day? Nope. Wow. What were some of the, after that, that, that truck ride, after you sort of were with the other children, did it still feel fun for a few days or did it start sort of military training? Um, on the way to this camp or place, uh, when I say camp, it's not like barbed wires all over the place. It's, all, all, it's, it's sort of an open camp, it's an open prison. There's no um, fence around it. It's just sort of uh, one section um, of the province that they take me to this. But on the way going in there, it was still singing. Um, and my mind going through is that because when I entered the gate, there's other truckloads of children also moving out. So it's still in my thought that you know, those individual kids uh, is returning home. But later on, I learned that that's not the case. Those were, um, the children have already graduated, uh, who've gone training and graduated and now becoming sort of a full-pledged um, uh, Khmer Rouge who um, transferring to uh, different provinces within uh, the, the country. But for the first couple of days, um, it's not uh, quite into a military sort of um, training, or it just start a very small lecture. So there's some freedom for me to move around. Okay. Did looking back at those experiences, like those lectures, were they trying to convince you of why you should be here and why you should be fighting? The lecture is not all about why I should be fighting. But the lecture was to teach you that the isolation of it, meaning that most of the lecture once I start to is they starting to tell me that you or I am now belong to the government which is in Khmer term is Ongkan. So I belong to the government. My soul, my spirit, my physical body belong to the government. The government will tell you what to say, what to do, and when to do, uh, and when to eat. On the same time, at the same time, they lacking sure us that everyone surrounded you are your enemies go on to my sibling now becoming my enemies, my parents became uh, becoming my enemies. Love is prohibited um, unless it is approved by the Anka. So everything that we taught is to say, do not trust anyone. If you hear or heard of anyone talking uh, about the government, I should be a snitch. I should report to the government. So in that sense, is no one trust. So I don't trust anybody um, on that because some one of the, um, the promotion doing that training and lecture is that if you snitch on somebody, that the government will promote you into a 
very fast into a higher ranking and it's a little bit better in terms of living standards and, and act and mobilization where you can move around into a certain area because now you have some sort of authority to um, you know, mobile yourself. Okay. Uh, so you had a, a bit of an incentive to sort of follow those rules and mm -hmm. sort of believe. Mm -hmm. did, did you sort of inside, do you, did you believe what they were telling you? Did you come to the terms where you said, I'm not just following the rules, I actually now believe in the rules? Well, in my province is um, sort of the, the first province that's almost the original birth for the Khmer Rouge back in the late 60s. So when I was born, it's almost, if you're looking into, if you're living in a ghetto in the United States, that you're born into that ghetto, that everything surrounding you is all about drugs and violence and prostitution. Those are the environments sort of compared to, I was born into a section where it has been controlled by Khmer Rouge. So in terms of That aspect, I, it, um, it, it, it's almost born into it. I remember, um, if, if you read history, that um, you know, learning or, uh, or studying is prohibited during the era. But I was not facing that case. I remember that I was being taught one to one under a, a tamarind tree how to learn, uh, how to read and write Cambodia. And I believe this is a way of doing, teaching you to believe the ideology of what they are trying to um, lead the country into. Sure, sure. Because at six and seven, you're, you're learning to read maybe for the first time as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. your education is coming from these people as well in some ways. That is correct. And um, um, yes. Okay. How about now? Um, the military training. Mm -hmm. the, the film tells us, you know, at the age of six or seven is, is, is when this happened. Mm -hmm. Did they give you weapons right away? Did, is that something that happened later after you sort of passed some tests? Um, the weapon is not given right away. I think it's in, in a few years into the training and lecturing uh, that I think it was maybe the age of nine or so that when I first um, have access to weapons. Um, but it, it's mo a lot of things is that you um, it's doing a lot of training. So and then within that training, you do a lot of um, uh, movement where you're going through one place to the next um, on a different field trip. We'll say you can say field trip so that you can uh, see what's going on in 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 your area and then other section of the area and in other provinces. So it, it basically all about lecturing that you have to support the government, you have to work for the government, uh, do not trust anybody um, in, in the first few years. Okay. If you didn't have much trust of the people, did you make friends? Um, did you notice anybody from the neighborhood that was sort of was in a similar circumstance and they were taken? Um, no, I didn't know anybody from the neighborhood that um, were in my group. Um, the, the idea was to um, relocate everyone to different area that you most likely to not run into someone that live in the same village. So they all disperse out into differences. And um, one of the things that I think is that the structure itself in the, you know, learning not to trust is how the structure is that I am in charge of 15 individuals in, in, in a group. So within that 15, you have me be the top. And then within the 14, they chose another one to be in charge of the other 13. And then go down the line to the single digit. So the, the second person would be overseeing the, the single First person. So, of course, you can't trust, you can't say anything because it's already built up. So, if, if you say something, they're going to report to the second, third, up to all the way to me, 
and I had to report to a higher um, official. Okay, okay. What would happen if um, one of your fellow children, someone in this group, were to break the rules or, or snitch? Um, would they just be taken out of the group and you wouldn't see what happened? Or did you see like punishment in front of everyone? Um, not so much of the children that were, were you chosen to be, uh, if they break the rule and then facing severe um, punishment. Um, the training is normally would be what we call it in, in, if in high school you send to a homeroom, right, or after school, whatever, detention or whatnot. Mm -hmm. It sort of uh, help um, tell them that what they're doing was wrong in, uh, in regarding to children wrongdoing. But um, the, the training is, is also that normally they would um, bring in the accuser, uh, someone who accused of a crime. Um, for example, it would be working with America or work anywhere with somebody, but that's this example. Um, that would put them and then we would be um, uh, putting into this thing moving forward a little bit into uh, choosing one of us to do the execution. So those are some of the training that did you want to continue on that thought a little bit? I mean, the, the execution obviously is something that, if you read in the history books, we, we do see occur during this genocide. Um, is that something that you had a personal sort of stake in? Um, I do not. In, in the training, uh, when I think this is at the age, probably about eight or probably around nine years old now, um, when we are given uh, access to weapons. So one of the training that did, and also another field trip, is basically we go to different um, prison camps where we witnesses all the tortures and um, others uh, inhumane uh, treatment that occurred during the era. Um, but it also personally in individual training that you are being uh, bringing the accusers to stand right in the middle, they, they stand and then you have children um, around it and then the government will choose one of us to perform execution. Uh, I personally have not chosen to do an execution um, during that era, but I know people uh, in my platoon, in my group have done so. Some of these experiences, hearing them, they seem um, very different um, than what we might be used to in North New Jersey here, uh, up in Massachusetts, where, where you come from. Mm -hmm. Does a memory like that stay with you up until today? Absolutely. I think all these memories will stay with me, not just up to date, but many more years in the future. I think this kind of memory I can never forget, uh, completely forget, until I pass away. So this will be sticking with me for the rest of my life. When did your experiences continue until? You, you came around six or seven, and when did you uh, sort of um, leave, I guess, as a child soldier? So moving forward a little bit, um, and I just want to share a little bit between before I lead into when did I really get out from the child soldiers or my platoon, is that moving forward a little bit, I was about probably nine, ten now, so I have gone through all the training um, that I had uh, exposed to weapons that was available, including AK-47, M16, 9mm, um, and all type of grenade there was because it wasn't training. So I have all those. Um, so at that age, I now graduated and has now been, uh, what do you call, fully um, admitted to as a formal, former Khmer Rouge soldiers with, come with weapons. So. 
I had an AK-47 and a 9mm and um, magazines that I do have, you see, and carry in there and um, different types of grenades on me at all the time. So, and I was to put in charge of patrolling my province. And that patrolling is basically my duty to make sure um, nobody escaped from my province or my village to the next, or the others, people trying to escape from the other village coming into my village. That's one thing. The other one I patrol is almost up two mountains where um, sometimes it took months from the start and then end and then come back. It's sometime in group, but most of the time uh, I would be patrolling alone. Mm -hmm. um, and you wonder, would you be scared? Uh, no, I, basically I'm not scared. Um, it's because as a child, I, I have no other second thought. And B is that when you are a full-fledged Khmer Rouge, now you come with authority. Mm -hmm. So everybody uh, do not dare uh, talk to you. And that authority come with, if I seen somebody um, trying to escape, which very fortunate I have not, that I have the authority to execute that individual on the spot, no question asked. So I have that ultimate power to um, either let somebody live or die. So, so you're walking into a, the province, into like a village. Mm -hmm. um, you're only 10 years old, but mm -hmm. because of the AK-47 and because of they understand what your role is, there's people much older than you, your mm -hmm. parents' age, your grandparents' mm -hmm. age, mm -hmm. that are scared of you? Absolutely. Um, and remember I gave you in terms of the, the structure itself, it just go down the line. So everybody not talking to anybody because you can't talk about um, trying to uprise or <coughs> trying to hurt a Khmer soldier because if you try to talk uh, to someone to hurt me, then how do you know that individual that overseeing you or you told not go tell somebody else? that putting your life in a much greater danger. Um, that, was the, that structure was the safeguard, and I think it's, that's why it was so effective. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody could actually really try to uprise against the Khmer Rouge during the regime. Okay, okay. So this continued for, for years, or, or it, eventually it did, um, so uh, it did end? Eventually it ended when, and most people say during the Vietnam invasion or during the Vietnam liberation of Cambodia, which is in 1979. So in 1979, uh, Khmer Rouge sort of tested um, Vietnamese military, um, and then unfortunately the, mili uh, the Vietnamese say, well, I, I, I don't like what you're trying to do now, and they just walk right into so that. So what happened is when Vietnam invaded Cambodia, my platoon and others were putting in charge of uh, leading hundreds and tens of thousands of people away from the front line. So we were the second tier for, up from the front line, uh, leading these individuals away from the front line and from, from the, all the fighting. At some point, <clears throat> the front line has been overpowered by the, Khmer Rouge, I mean, by the uh, Vietnamese troop. And our platoon now become the first front line to, uh, to, um, to exchange and, and to lead this individual. So during that journey, I had four different occasions where uh, we exchanged battlefield. We in the front line fighting with the Vietnamese troops. So by the fourth um, exchange firefighter, it, we became exhausted in resources. So that means the ammunition, um, the, the food and everything and all has been um, exhausted and we dissolve ourselves. So we're no longer leading the group, we're no longer protecting these in, um, people. We would just dissolve ourselves, our weapon is thrown away and everything. It just, so we just walk among the individuals. So that's when actually the, officially the date that I was sort of out. So not by, it's just by, yeah. Now some people might hear this and say, um, 
did you run home then? Because now you were sort of let go, but home seems to have been very far away. I mean, you, you didn't go home. By then, um, by from the day that Vietnam start to um, enter, invaded Cambodia, to then, I was, have been already way up in the east, uh, northeast up there. So it has been too long, and I wouldn't even know where or how to get back um, to find home. Mm -hmm. And home was not in, in, in the thought at that time. So after I dissolved myself, I am now walking among the people, um, I think, uh, northeastward, um, approaching Thailand border. Um, during that journey, I became ill. Um, I became very, very, very lonely, um, and, and I almost died during that journey. Um, a lot of you probably know the Ghostbuster movie, right? Yeah, you guys seen all those Michelin tire uh, sort of advertisement, or was it a ghost who becomes the Michelin tire, that big one? I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so anyway, so that's how my body was sort of popped out, was swollen with water dripping down. So I, and, and I almost died, and it definitely, um, you know, I know kind of funny looking backwards and something like that, but it, it was uh, uh, another scary moment that, that I, I thought I would die. Did, did you cross the border to Thailand to, to get to like a, a, a place for refugees? So at home we reached the border of, of Cambodia and Thailand, um, and we stayed there, I believe, I'm not sure how long, probably a couple of months uh, or so before, um, the UNHCR or the Red Cross uh, would go in there and, uh, and help provide some food and other um, nutrition for the um, people who are trying to flee the country. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they had somehow worked out with the Thailand government um, to build a refugee camp. And it called Sakai One, and that's where I was going to Sakai One to transfer from the border of Thailand and Cambodia into Thailand, called Sakai One refugee camps. Yeah, this has been an unbelievable program, and we, we still have time. But I just want, for the interest of time, a, a big sort of question I think for a lot of people in the audience is Cambodia, Thailand, Connecticut. Uh, <laughs> how, how does that work now, from 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 the refugee camp? To, to, a, to a home in Connecticut? Um, so when I was in the Sakai One, which is the first camp that I'd enter, and then I got another transfer from um, Camp One to Camp Two, which is Sakai Two. There, um, people, so I'm in, in a village, I mean, I'm not in a village, in the um, orphanage center. So in an orphanage center, you every orphans in that uh, center had name. They written in a little piece of paper and they put in a basket, a pool. So every month they would pick a certain number of paper from that and whomever name that they being picked would be posted and looking as a sponsor. So I was one of the lucky that was being picked and then I got sponsored by my um, adopted parents, which you've seen a little bit in the movie, to um, Middletown, Connecticut in September uh, 1983 through uh, the, I believe, the Lutheran Church Services, I believe, that did all, do all the coordination in terms of sponsorship and also looking for um, adopted parents for uh, individuals. Okay. So that's how I, from from Cambodia, Thailand, and then here in the United States. Okay. And of course, the story continues because the transition was difficult. But maybe, if, if, if I can, are there any uh, students or faculty who might have some questions for Sion? Maybe on, um, yep, if you could just kind of use a, a big voice so we can all hear, and I'll repeat the question for you. Sure. Um, after your visit to Cambodia, now that it's been 40 years since the genocide, what's the aftermath? Like when you went there, how was your, how did you see your country? So was Correct. that his first time back? Um, uh, and we, we do see that he was pre prepping for a trip mm -hmm. to Cambodia. Uh, yes, that was my first time back after 35 uh, years plus. So what happened is that Cambodia is still in a very poor nation. And when I go there, it's, it's a lot of uh, things that continue to 
uh, happened um, almost like during the Khmer Rouge regime, but in a lesser um, sort of, uh, what would you say, more upfront, you know, there's a little bit more um, quiet way of doing things, doing business, killing or whatnot. But my feeling is that when I go to Cambodia, the Cambodian people call me a foreigner. So I not welcome to my own native um, country. Um, so when I came to the United States back, I'm treated as a foreigner. Um, although I am a natural American citizen, but so I still am a, an individual with no country. When I go back to Cambodia, I am a foreigner. When I come here, I'm a foreigner. So where am I in between in terms of the country that I really belong to and the people who really think that I should be belong to? I still don't have a country that I, although I am love America, but that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you had mentioned um, uh, as many as eight siblings. So when you go back um, uh, to Cambodia for the first time to try to find them and, and connect with them, um, did you make that connection? Were they still alive? Did they make it through? Yes, when I came, I think um, six survived. Uh, I have a sibling of eight, um, including me, so but that six survived. One presumed um, uh, passed away uh, according to my sibling in still living in Cambodia now, they think that she is uh, dead. But we have not uh, find her body, or they have not find the body or to confirm that she is dead. Okay. So. And, and, and um, before we get to another question, <laughs> how about your parents? My parents passed away, both have been passed away, in um, one of them I believe in 86, <clears throat> and the other one a few years after. So you never made that connection again after take, being taken at age of six? Uh, no. Does that, that's got to be very difficult. I <clears> imagine <throat> also there's got to be a lot going through your head about their role on that day as well. With the film, um, and I believe that you're going to see a fold, uh, is, is like you mentioned, it's going to be in PBS and I believe in your area, probably like Channel 13, is that what it is? Yeah, Channel 13. So yep. Channel 13, sometime in May, um, you will, if, if you want it to look. But I just want to tell you a little bit what it is. So my thought, when I mentioned a little bit in this introduction, that you see that the question that I had toward my parents, that they done enough, that they done enough to keep me um, with them when I was a child. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in a movie, I'd, I'd uh, shared that half of my life, I grew to hate my parents, especially my mom, um, because I believe that she had abandoned me, she had given up on me, and that's why I'm um, so alone, uh, lonely, and suffer. Um, I haven't gone back and heard the testimony, especially from my younger sister, which is the still survive, that not a single second that my mom not mention my name to my other sibling, that they need to look for me, and that, that the love that she have is basically that when I heard that testimony, I was, I felt so guilty of having the wrong feeling toward my mom uh, in, her, in terms of her uh, unconditional love for me. Uh, and before she passed away, the second before she passed away, according to my sister, is always, my name is always in her thought. And that was not a, an easy feeling to, to really have hate her so many years and, and then found out that she was lead to the last breath that she never forgot about me. Wow. Were you able to pay your respects when you went back to Cambodia? I did. I went to the um, cemetery, uh, but both of them uh, were buried next to my great-grand 
um, father um, burial site and I did a, a traditional Buddhist sort of ceremony um, to pay my respect and I did um, apologize on in terms of my thought of, of how I felt about her. So I did have the, the chance to do that. Okay. Do, we, do we have more questions right here, nice and loud? I was in a black hole. It was nothing's gone through my mind. All I'm trying to do was just live on. Um, really, I, I just, um, just living day by day, that was my thought, trying to make sure I at least get something to eat and trying to survive. It was tough. Yeah, there's a hand over here. Um, well, I don't believe in any religion actually, even Buddhist. So I'm not a Buddhist. Uh, I do not have any um, personal um, thought against any religion. Um, but I believe in good thing. That's what I was uh, in, in good faith of in terms of doing good deeds. So I know I'm not a religious, I'm not a Buddhist, but I go to the temple. I go to Hindu temple, I go to church, I go to anywhere that is open the door for me to go in. Um, because I believe that with good deed it probably be enough that, that I do not have to think about specifically on any individual or um, religions that I should be really fully belong to, because I, I, that's what I, I think. Yes, up front here. Have you ever met any of the other um, child soldiers that were in your community again? Uh, no, I have not met any um, uh, in t the child soldier in my platoon, all those. Um, a lot of child soldiers in Khmer Rouge did uh, came to the United States, um, but do not uh, do not wish to share and talk about their involvement in the Khmer Rouge itself. Was there so, a hand back there? Or no? Yep, uh, Dr. Heller. I hesitate returning to the subject of the horror. But how was it? Miraculously, that so many members of your family survived. Well, I learned through uh, going back to Cambodia. You'll see there was three brothers, but I think, or the older one, let's say, Sao's. So most of my older sibling, up to me, was in the Khmer Rouge um, army. Uh, some of them are, one at least admitted that he was in the very high rankings military. If you compare to the United States Army ranking, he could be a four and a half star general during the genocide. Um, the other one had been not admit, but he did admit that's a lot of training that he got from Chinese uh, military's uh, personnel. Uh, using Morse code. So he was uh, responsible for sending all these secret and Morse code throughout during the region, um, during that era. And he also commanded the Navy um, Army uh, Armed Force in during that genocide. So does that mean maybe the safeguard of any memory, family member? Perhaps, maybe, but. Then I also learned that the four and a half star general was in his way to being executed right leading up to 
the last day of the Khmer Rouge because he was being accused by somebody of financially stolen from the military. So if there really is no, then there's really no safeguard for anyone, even a four-star general could be executed by someone else higher. Also, in, in the film, one of the revelations that you have is when you make contact with a brother, do I have this right that he and others still have high regard for Pol Pot um, and, and, and the Khmer Rouge? Was that surprising? They do not, I wouldn't say high regard, I will say that they do question in terms of uh, accountability and responsibility to the number of deaths. So they believe that the Khmer Rouge did not commit all the dead right after the, the death that after the Vietnam invaded Cambodia. They defended him that because in their opinion, is a, I'm not sure, it's a, they, according to them, they think there's a lot of people die right after the 19, uh, or during that little window after Khmer, uh, Pol Pot was um, overthrown. That that period, there's a lot of people die and someone else is responsible beside Pol Pot itself. I think that's, they was you right. They were, they were. They believe that that's okay. that's not the, re, the responsibility of Pol Pot after that that time. I got that so so I it's essentially, because the U.S. military, did you have any any connection? Did you see them by any by any chance um, at, at the time? Um, no, I did not have any personal um, contact with foreign um, military personnel. However, there are bomb shells that are being built next to my house because, and I can literally see there's a bomb. There is a, a mall, I would say a section, there's a section of mall that has been demolished by bombing from the American uh, B-52 bombing. It basically just demolished that whole section. And that is about, that, that market is about I will say probably 15 kilometers from where I live. So you can see when they drop it at night, I can see this light lifting up just like crazy. And, uh, and you can see very bright on top of a tree or coconut tree that's around there. You can completely see like daylight when this bomb just going up and, and, and all these light scenes, it's, it, it's scary. But that I personally experienced in it, but not contact by uh, the personnel phone. No, absolutely. Th thank you. I think we have time for one more. And over here. Yep, Jill. I did not disguise, remember, just disguise myself or have been anybody ask if I'm a Khmer Rouge or not and I have to lie about. The, the circumstances that when and uh, that Sakai one known to be the Khmer Rouge camp, meaning so most of the people who actually enter that Sakai one were former Khmer Rouge soldier, or somehow, somewhere is. So then we are known as a Khmer Rouge camp. So I guess that's why I did not have the experience of have to hire my entity because assuming that everybody were former Khmer Rouge and I don't have to, they didn't ask. So I did not face that. Well, I wanna thank Sion for coming and sharing his stories with us today. Thank you very much. You can watch the whole film on PBS. Yes, well, thank you, John. And uh, you all, hopefully, you have the, um, a chance to watch the whole movie on PBS on sometime in May. So thank you very much. Thank Good luck. You.